some place in Louisville where you you eat and it's called um, uh, let's see Dog Patch Restaurant. I got one today. When anyone eats there, then they take the money that you gave them and send the church the tithing off of it. <laughs> it's somewhere at uh, 319 West Jefferson Street. I guess that's why Billy had it laying here, so that they could see. Um, that's mighty nice. Now, brethren, I don't know what your procedure of, of man's meeting, just what you do, or how you conduct your meetings. And if I get off a schedule here, why, off the regular routine, why, you call my attention to it. It was purpose tonight, I thought, as I had uh, a dinner not long ago with our most beloved pastor, Brother Neville, and I was saying something to him what was on my heart. And I thought, if we get a bunch of men together and the ministers, our, our uh, colleagues here of the gospel and man we could talk to one another in a way that we wouldn't talk it before the public because we're all and uh, we're man at understand is man Christian man and that way uh, usually in a congregation a group you say something and and want to lean it a little this way and want to lean it that way and, and then it goes all out but where we come to try tonight to tell you what I have in my heart uh, concerning the church and its, uh, and its uh, place and its position. And then if we get on in time, I would like to speak to you just a little bit on the Word, if it's all right. Yeah. Just kind of settle that. So we get our business part or the part that I'd like to express to you first. And I guess... Maybe you let out regular time, about 9.30 or something like that, like each night. Uh, well, I'll try not to keep you long. Tomorrow's Saturday, and it's a big commercial day. But now, uh, we have to get our groceries and so forth. I want to say to Brother Neville publicly, and I, I, I want to say to each one of you, just like I was talking privately to you, just each one, because you're a group that... That's, uh, I really think that and believe and teach that man, God has made man leadership of his church, of his people, yeah. see? And it's, uh, as I was preaching down to Brother um, Junie Jackson's last night about God fortified his, his people with his word. And it was a woman that broke through that line and gave vent to reason. And when it did, God forever has always placed it for his, uh, for man to keep his church fortified by word. Now, uh, I want to encourage Brother Neville just a little talking to him privately. I noticed last night, the Zerm has struck me two or three times while I was in the pulpit, and I turned around because I'm trying to keep as far away from it as I can until I find out what the dream meant to me here not long ago, a few weeks ago. It stuck with me for a long time. I told it here in the church about something about the message and, and discernment and so forth that just didn't, just wasn't coming out right. To my opinion, that time's over. And um, I may be wrong on that. But I noticed that it, it, um, Brother Neville was kind of weary and uh, upset. And uh, I just want you to know, Brother Neville, that you're only anticipating in this fellowship in that have you just noticed what Satan's tried to do in the last few days? To, what ministers that's associated in this fellowship? They just stop for a few minutes and wonder. There's this Brother Crace sitting here tonight, almost killed up there on the road. See? And uh, I almost had my head blown off with a shotgun, or with a rifle. See? Satan trying to take us. And there you crashed right in and could have killed yourself and some woman also. See, just the ministers. Look at just the... The ministering group. It's Satan. And he's trying to get rid of us. Now, we are realized that we're not assembled here to talk on some kind of a business. We're here to assemble to talk on, the, on Christ and the hopes to take a hope and what to do for this present time. And I, I want to encourage you, Brother Neville, 
uh, be courageous. No matter what comes up, what goes, what takes place, just don't let nothing beset you. Just stand there like a rock of ages. And God will make everything come out all right. He's proved that to you. Of course, that could have upset you. That could have killed that woman. And that had been on your mind the rest of your days. And there had been a lot of things. But God is still on the throne. He, he lets those things work out all right. It could have taken us, too. And um, so Satan fighting at the church. Now, when I laid that cornerstone there that morning, I never felt that I'd ever be a pastor. It wasn't in my callings at the beginning. And my first call was to be on the field of evangelism as many years ago and started off over here in a tent just across the street. And I remember when Brother Roy Davis down there and his church burnt down, that bunch of people was just like scattered sheep without a shepherd, had no place to go. And I, Mr. Hipsonberg was chief of police then, and he called me down there and he said to me, I, we're here to help you, said, I'm Catholic myself, but said, them people said they don't probably have their clothes as during the time of the Depression, said they go to other churches and they feel out of place, and they're good people. I know many of them. He said, Billy, if you want to start a church, he said, I want you to know that we're behind you and anything we can do to help you. And I thanked him for it. We had a tag day. First, we prayed and asked the Lord, and people come to me and wanted to build a church so it could have a place to go. And uh, we decided this place, and one night long, this time we're a little further here in a pile of horse weeds right along in here in water, in this ditch, and this had been a, like a dump-like. Well, the Lord spoke to me definitely and said, build it right here. Not a penny of money. And among us, we had about, eight, about 80 cents or a dollar. And that, of course, you would laugh at that now. But brother, that was some money then. When some neighbor cook a pot of beans and get the neighbor hadn't had enough for two or three days, come over and eat a few of them. Yeah, that was t- hard times. A lot of the young fellows never seen that. Well, that was hard going. Yeah. I've seen a time that you could pass through this church, a pl- collection plate, two times or three and get 30 cents. I have a place packed full and begged for it. Yeah. it would, you'd probably got 30 cents and had a good offering. I mean, it's really rough going. And we had nothing to build with yet. The the desire of the people was to build a church so he could have a place to go. Because in them days, the message, well, you think it's badly thought of now, you ought to know it then, when there's nobody. And then uh, this water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and uh, the blessings and things that we believe in and stand for. So, upon my heart, I made a, a promise to God that we would stay here and build the tabernacle. The morning we laid the cornerstone, he met me over there in a vision about 8 o'clock that morning when I was sitting there watching out across the sun coming up just about this time of year. And he had told me after he had met me down there on the river, but that when the angel of the Lord appeared in the, that light, and I seen it in a distance, it looked like a star, and it come right down over where I was, and them notable words were spoken. And uh, so then... Uh, purpose then to get a place for the people to worship in. Now, I thought myself, it ain't for me. It's nothing to me. But yet, anything that's con- pertaining to God is part of me. No matter if it's anything that's it's, uh, for God's children, it's for me, whether it's my duty to do this or do that, it's my duty to see to God's heritage regardless of where it's at. See? Just like you say, well, my, like as a little boy, you say, my, my business is just to chop the wood, not pack it in. Let John pack it in. I don't care if snow falls or it rains. Let him get out and get it. No, it's your duty as a, as a, a child of that home to see that that wood don't get wet for your mother. See, pack it in. If they say, well, Frank should have went and got the water. It ain't my business. But if Frank didn't get the water, it's your business to take care of the water. That's all. Uh, that's just the way it runs, and that's the way it runs in God's family, too. Yeah. If some of them, some of them say, well, not long ago, I said, quit preaching the way you are. My goodness, you're going to ruin every friend you got and everything like that. I said, let that alone. I know it's wrong, but my, it ain't our business. Well, whose business is it then? If it's wrong, somebody's got to do it. Yeah. So let's just do it. And that's the way I feel about the church. The building programs and so forth has come up and down, up and down. 
And there's been pro and con in the buildings and so forth. One wanted and the other didn't want it and this, that. You, you find it like that. You can find that as you deal amongst ministers, amongst businessmen, amongst lodges, everywhere you go, where you got a group of men, you, you've got different ideas. And so therefore, you've got to have one person that you put confidence in and elect that person all work with that. Just like in the army, you've got to have one as a general. That's the headquarters. The captain says this, he's the captain of that group, but then the general can change his orders. And the chief commanding general, of course, is Jesus Christ in the church. And his ministers are his uh, captains of the companies that, that's uh, representing him here on earth. And they have tried many things, the little tabernacle here. And finally, I kept quiet in it just to see after I'd built it. And then the Lord called me out into the field about 15, 16 years ago, and I left the church. But still... I just can't turn it out. I've always kept my name attached to it so that I could be a vote sometime. If the wrong thing got started in here, I'd have a right to come and, and stop it because I've sweated it out for many years behind this pulpit, 17 years in here to keep the thing straight. When all kinds of isms and ins and outs and every kind of a cult and being the interdenomination, everything that flew in, flew in this way. And by the help of God, we stood here with the unadulterated gospel, and she still stands the same tonight. Uh, so we, but uh, this times that this church has been tried to be sold out from under me and everything else like that, if my name wasn't attached to it down there, why, it sure would be been an awful fix tonight. Not, and it wasn't me, it was God, of course, that did it. And then, as I see it now coming into the place that it is, and we're living in a great hour, it's still my interest to say something about this church, see, because it's, it's a part of me. No matter whether I'm here or not, it's still a part of me. And it's my duty to see to it that it operates clean, clear, and the best I can for the kingdom of God. And I'm very grateful that in these days I see it's got little satellites to it that I am grateful for. Brother uh, Chris here. And his Sellersburg group and a brother back there that just uh, taken Brother Snelling's place at Utica and Brother Ruddle up here and Brother Junior Jackson and those precious boys who are a fine man, wonderful man of God. They preached this message. Now, they made one might disagree just literally up on something or another. That's only human amongst the group of the ministers yet. And um, if ministers have a little difference, it, there won't be a a shadow of a difference in it. Maybe one might say, I believe that the millennium will come and Jesus will be on a white horse. And they say, I believe when he comes, he'll come on a white cloud. Well, as long as they believe he's coming, that's the main thing, you see. No matter how he's coming, just they believe he's coming and making ready for it. And um, that way, I have tried to find out, and I've been studying, I've told it out before the congregation. I've been studying the early church. And I watched the way that those anointed men uh, prepared uh, the house of the Lord and the order of the Lord's worship in the house. And I, it struck me real, real good. And I preached here some time ago and upon the subject of Joel uh, 2, I will restore, saith Amen. the Lord, all the years of the palmer worm eaten and a caterpillar and canker worm and so yeah. forth. And um, I began to study on that about what these men did and the way that they um, taking care of the church that God had left them overseer. Now we're going to start off with the early church and just bring it for about five minutes now down to what they did and then I can show you the vision that I have for the future. Now at the beginning... The church was inaugurated at Pentecost, and there the Holy Spirit fell upon them where Jesus had chosen twelve. And uh, one of them had fallen, and they chose Matthias to take his place, and the Holy Spirit waited until all this was in order before it come. They had to choose one to take the bishopry of, of Judas that fell by transgression to fulfill the Scripture. And... I believe that all these things has a time of lingering 
waiting, but it's waiting for a time for the Scripture to be fulfilled. That everything gets right, everything in order, waiting. Many times we get patient, impatient like a child. We great, get great anticipations and many times jump way ahead. And that, that just hinders the work until the work gets caught up, you see. We must just move reverently, have a purpose in heart that God, if He would desire to use us in such and such, but wait till He makes the opening because He has to go back ahead of us. You remember David going to battle that night? He was weary about that fight and he laid under those mulberry trees until he heard the Lord and the rumbling of the leaves going before him. Then he went with courage Amen. because he knew that God had gone before him. And if we'd only do that, brother, knowing the battle must come, but we must wait till we see the hand of God going before us to make a way. Amen. Now, I noticed that how the churches, the evangelism started scattering out everywhere. And then we'll take, for instance, Paul becoming a great missionary to our people. We find out that he went about wherever the Lord led him and he established a church. And it was a new faith. The churches of those days, like in Asia Minor, all throughout Europe, they, they didn't believe that message. And when he had uh, uh, preached the message, and many was converted to it, then there was uh, no one, uh, if he left the people in that condition, they'd wander right back out into their pagan gods and into Judaism and whatever more, because the people had no one to teach them. The, the converts, they had no place to go. So Paul established churches in different parts of the country. Each one of these churches, he left someone who was an order, a man that was trustworthy, a man that was known as a pastor, shepherd, or uh, then after he, this church then become other little churches come out of it, young man and old man raised up and become uh, churches out of that, the man that was over the first church was called the bishop. And then his that went out from him, his children was called shepherds or pastors. And then this group of little churches all would come back to this bishop. Like in the time of Irenaeus, he carried on the same thing. Martin carried on the same thing. Polycarp. Carried on the same thing right on down through the age. They had that. And then the apostle of the church. The apostle, that was the Paul. And when Paul left, John took over the church. And when John left, Polycarp taken it over. When Polycarp left, Irenaeus taken it over. And on down, Martin and so forth. Just kept on going until the Roman Catholic Church broke the whole thing to pieces and burned them and scattered them and the polymer worm eat this and the canker worm eat that and so forth, eat that and eat that until they brought it plumb down to a stalk. Now, but God promised to restore again that same thing. I have, I do believe with all my heart that we're living in the last days. I believe that there, there's not too much would break this anything, and my interpretation may be wrong, of the Scriptures, that Jesus could not come tonight. I believe it, and what little's left to be fulfilled could be fulfilled before daylight in the morning. Yeah. And I'd see, and I may be wrong on the time of that fulfilling, but it's at hand. The, I believe that. Yeah. And remember... Paul believed that. John believed that. Polycarp believed that. Irenaeus believed that. Martin believed that. All the rest of them believed it. What if God would have told John the Revelator, now it's going to be 2,000 years before my coming. John would have come back and told the church, well, I guess we might as well eat, drink, be merry because there are going to be many generations. See? Uh, Jesus ain't coming for 2,000 years. See? 
So, see, the church had been loose. There'd have been no on the mark. There'd have been no way. And after all, it's your anticipations if you fall asleep in that watch that you wake with them same anticipations because they ain't going to hinder one thing. You're going to be right there on time anyhow. Yeah. See? see what I mean? Now, when, when St. Martin awakes in the resurrection, St. Paul, all the rest of them, it'll be just as fresh as if they was right in the battle, battling right away because he went right down under those same anticipations looking for his coming and there'll be a screen coming up will come the whole church, you see. That'll be it. So it doesn't matter. See, we've got to be looking for him right now. Even, we don't know, it, it could be possible, it, it could be a hundred years from now. It could be five hundred years, a thousand years, ten thousand years, I don't know. Nobody knows. But say, for instance, that we live each day that he was coming that day. See, if we live like he was coming this day, when we awake, if we sleep, and we awake in the resurrection, it'll be just as fresh as if we'd just fallen asleep, just woke up. A trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. See? So it'll be just as fresh. But now, until that time, until he comes, we want to live each day like he might come the next minute because it might be the end of your life at that minute. You don't know when you're going. This may be some of our last breath. We have it in us now. So you want to live like it is. But now, to carry on further, we've got to put footprints here on the sands of time that others can see. If Paul hadn't went on the way he did, then John wouldn't have known how to follow. If John hadn't went on, Polycarp wouldn't have known how to follow. If Polycarp wouldn't have went on, Irenaeus wouldn't have known how to follow. If Irenaeus wouldn't have went on, Martin would have known how to follow. See what I mean? Each one has to put footprints on the sands of time. Well, if I thought that there was a denomination or any other group of believers that had anything better than we have here, brethren, I would have wanted to emerge this little body with it right quick. I've waited, I have longed, I have been under anticipations and believed that some great one was coming someday, or maybe a, a great prophet that a speak will come of the Elisha. I've always believed and thought maybe that maybe I'd live to see the day that when I could change, when I'd see that person rise on the scene, then I could take my little church and say, Brethren, this is the man we have looked for. This man, he is the one. I've waited for that. And if actually that is past, then I'm looking to say it from up here, Brethren, this is the one coming from here, see? And uh, I want to see the church kept up like that. I must have stepped on something or done something and put a lot of uh, more uh, life in that thing. So um, now I would like to say this, that now that this is an established church, let me just stop again just a moment. When I went to Bombay, I count that my greatest meeting because of the effects it had on the people. And I... If in Africa they say 30,000 came to Christ at one time, then there was 150 or 200,000 came to Christ at one time out of that half a million there. What could I do? There wasn't a thing. Perhaps maybe say there was, just say there was 100,000 of them. There was no church, nothing I could do. There's nobody to give to them. The message I believe, I, there wasn't even a Pentecostal denomination would cooperate with me. And all those souls probably drifted right back into Sikhs, Jans, Buddhism, whatever more they come from. No place to put them. Now that's a shame. Yeah. That's a disgrace. See, because I had no cooperation because of the stand that I take. Okay. Well, in Africa, I went in there are that auspices of the, uh, the, um, the AF of M and uh, African Faith Missions. And when I did, of course, I can't agree with them. They, they baptized people in a triune baptism three times face forward. And one of them baptizes three times backward. 
One for one God the Father, and the other for another God the Son, and the other for another God the Holy Ghost. And baptize them three different times for three different gods. And um, all such stuff as that. And perhaps the Durban meeting, not having it rightly, and the people see such a scattered amongst the Pentecostal faiths and so forth, the people didn't know what to do. They had no place to go. Perhaps what if we just had a revival here, brother? And let me place it like this. What if we just got through with a big revival and you, brethren, had just got converted and there wasn't a church of this type in the country nowhere? And I've been the evangelist and now I'm leaving out. You may never see me again. What would you do? You'd feel like you wouldn't know what to do. You can't go back to that waller again. You can't go back down there with, uh, with your wives to wear shorts and your, and, uh, to your card parties and dances and things like that and ever be satisfied again. You've come to life. You've raised above that thing. You've come to a place instead of saying, this is our creed, saying this is God's word. And you've come to live by this, what this says. And not what, and you go down there and listen to them and hear them go down and play bunco and have a dance and this, that, and the other, and a little bit of message that had nothing in it about some mayor or something or was going to be reelected or some kind of a political affair and cut off in 10 or 15 minutes after you've been sitting here day after day in great gastronomical jubilees of the word and things, you wouldn't know what to do. You'd be so burdened with it that some of you lay members would feel like starting up a church and start preaching it yourself because your heart would burn for the word of God and you'd feel bad for the people that felt the same way you did. Amen. Isn't that right? Amen. Though you know Jesus is coming, thought he was coming tomorrow, yet you'd want to do something today for those people who are fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. To come together, you want fellowship with them. That's right. So, if it's this way, now, I believe with all my heart, that the Lord has helped me and has used me to spearhead a great revival, one of the greatest that's ever struck the world since the early days across the world. We know that. That's right. It was all gone at that time. And, and he met me down there on the river and told me that the message that I had would forerun the second coming of Christ. And I suppose there's nobody here tonight that was down there that day that's been about 32 years ago. When that light appeared, and standing there, me looking right at it, hundreds of people standing looking at it, he come right down and that voice spoke. Years later, strange that the camera takes the same picture, looks the same thing, just exactly what I told you down the river. Now, I may be mistaken in a lot of things, brethren, but I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to be honest and straight with you. And then, <clears throat> another thing, if I'd have went away, what would it, we'd have never built a church here like that. It's hard to know what we'd have had. See? If I just went on. But the God of heaven put it up on my heart to build this church here. Yeah. And then when he called me out into evangelism, we've had pastor after pastor and so forth. Uh, but now we got a, a precious brother here who's uh, of the faith, believes the message. Yeah. We've got other brothers out here that believes the message. Having faith. Am I getting too loud, Brother Beeler? All right, let's see. Yeah. Um, had... Uh, we got, we got the material. And now you say, well, Brother Branham, if they won't hear these signs and wonders of the great God of heaven, how are we going to do it? Well, now, what if St. Paul would have had that same idea? See? What, but he didn't. Those bishops stayed just as loyal to the message. And, they, and Paul, ever so often after making his round, you've read the Bible, how he visit back with these churches. Talk with the pastors and with the bishops and so forth and took uh, relief from the people and, and had a, oh, just a great time of fellowship, like a revival or a big time of jubilee. And the Holy Spirit would fall upon them and messages would come. Look, when he went down there to Philip, even his daughters prophesied and said these chains in prison waiting for, the, for our brother when he gets up there. You know, more got out in the yard and here come Actipus, a prophet, walking down Looked across the street and never seen Paul before. The general overseer, this whole group of churches throughout Asia. And he walked over there and pulled the string off of his side. He had his garment tied with, bound his hands and said, Thus saith the Lord, chains and prisons wait for the one that wore this up there. See, prophesying, Paul said, I know it. 
I know it, but don't break my heart now. Let me finish my course. He was tired. He was finished. And he was going on and leaving his bishopry with Timothy. Now, we got to think of young people. We got children. Most of us people here, married man, has children. Well, what about them? It's coming on. See? Like I used to kick up down there about them, throwing those cast nets on the river and pulling out them perch and the drinks, drunkards and things. I've seen them piled high as this ceiling here. Big fine perch laying there to stink of be all around the river. I went out as a game warden to make them stop it. I got a letter to leave them alone. What are you going to do? It belongs to Kentucky. Now, Kentucky warden can't come over here. Because he's out of his territory. Indiana warden has nothing to say into it because the water belongs to Kentucky. There you are. There's nothing to be done. I said, I've got a boy coming on. We'd like to fish. Why did he put his picture in the paper if he caught a chub? 20 years from now, let that go on like that. Those nets, traps, and everything else, it's practically getting like that right now. See? What's the matter? You've got to think of these as coming on. So we've got to think of the others that's coming on behind us, these young people, and so forth. And a place for our children, our daughters. We don't want them out in the world and these things like that. We want them girls raised like their mothers. And we've got to make a, arrangements for that. And if there is no tomorrow, we don't know that. If there is no tomorrow, we haven't done nothing but been at the master's business and been found at our post of duty when he does come. See? So I would suggest this. I did to Brother Neville. Let's carry this on. Just as we have. Let's let it just the way it is. I'm grateful for these young ministers. See, actually, at the day of judgment, for this entire valley to hear, there'll be no excuse because we've got little churches setting out everywhere. Outposts, listening posts, waiting. Last night I was in Brothers Church and asked if all in there was 45 behind the word and every hand went up. Now, that made me feel good, see? Now, what I would think would be this, brethren. At, like in the church here, now, I, the, my ministry has the best of my thinking four things that can be done, and it might not be either four, but that's the only outlook I can think of. If that one had spoke to me down there on the river, if this is all that was left for the Gentile church, which we realized in Revelations, it says one, two, three chapters to the church. The church goes up in the fourth chapter. It does not return anymore to the 19th chapter that's after the tribulation period, when God calls out the Jews. That's right. And like Enoch, he went up before one drop of rain ever hit the earth. He was gone. Then the tribulation set in. Noah was in the ark before any tribulation set in. Lot was out of Sodom before any tribulation set in. See? And the church will be gone before any tribulation period. Now, during the tribulation, that will be the sleeping virgin will be hunted down by the dragon, spurts water from his mouth, which is, means multitudes and people, armies, that will search down and take this woman, a uh, uh, remnant of her seed, and will kill her. Now, that will be in the tribulation period. But the church will go home. Now, if, if that take, would take place tomorrow, it wouldn't hinder us from just keeping on today. Let's make today count. Now, what I think down there, if that angel that said those words to me, said, as John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of Christ, see, your message, I was to take this message and it would forerun the second coming of Christ. Well, if this has been it, and we're real, real close, brethren, because the hour and the light of the message had just about gone out. Did you notice when Pentecost fell and those brothers were filled at Pentecost with the Holy Ghost? It wasn't hardly any time until the message had begun to dim down and they begin to set up churches to hold the fort for Christ, expecting Him to come. Well, that's the same thing 
is taking place today, if the Scripture is true, I will restore, saith the Lord, Amen. all that the palm of worm and cake of worm has eaten. Now, if that be it, if that is the message, and God forgive me, I, I do not know. If that's it, then the time is close at hand, really, because the message is over. And the other night I was dreaming that I went to have discernment where a great host of my friends had gathered, thousands of them in a meeting. There's a fellow come got me, and Billy usually comes gets me because he don't talk to me. And this man just talked to Blue Street, and before I got over there, all the anointing was gone from me for it. And then I said, well, let's go there and, and preach the message of telling those people don't fool those denominations and so forth and come out like this. And when I got to the platform, that had left me. I don't know what it meant, but I was going on. I just don't know. It could be the end of my road. It could be the coming of the Lord. It could be the change of the day. It could be the coming of that mighty one if it's to be another besides what's already come. It could be that. All those things we'd have to draw from, it would be. And as I stand here tonight before God and you, brethren, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. If I did, I'd tell you. Or I wouldn't mention bring anything up like this if I didn't know which way. If I know which way... The thing was going, I'd, I'd say it, but I don't know. I can't tell. I'm going right now on meetings without one speck of leading. I'm going because I don't want to set up there. I, I, I like to get out in the woods as well as anybody. If I'm wrong in this, God forgive me. There's three things could happen to me. It's either the end of my road and let this other one come on. I've opened up the road for him to take over cause remember the one that comes to preach will be on the word, Amen. restoring the faith of the children back to the fathers. It could be the end of my road. It could be that he's changing my ministry back into evangelism for overseas. Or it could be that he's not going to call me anymore for an evangelist, and he's taking me into the wilderness somewhere to anoint me, to send me forth like the promised one is to come, I think. There could be any of those things. I cannot go on the way I've been going because I'm the people has believed me, I, I have to say this, I said before, man, the people many times regard me as being a prophet. I do not regard myself that. No, sir, I do not. I have, I don't say that to be humble, I say that to be truthful. I do not regard myself to be a prophet of the Lord. I, I haven't that honor. I believe that the Lord has used me and little special things to help maybe lay a foundation for a prophet that will come. But a prophet doesn't operate the way I operate. Now, you know that. A prophet isn't an evangelist. And an evangelist isn't a prophet. A pastor isn't an evangelist, and an evangelist isn't a pastor. But God has said in the church... First apostles, then prophets, then teachers, then pastors, and so forth. God set them in the church, and God gave them an office. But the morning when I laid that cornerstone, because, now if you're spiritual, you get it, because of the cry of the people. If you could break that out or take the book and read it, it said, do the work of an evangelist. Didn't call me to be an evangelist. But said, do the work of an evangelist, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But for he for themselves together, teachers having itching ears, and shall turn from truth to fables. See? Quoted that scripture and told me where to find it. Said it three times. And I got the Bible and turned to where he told me, and there it was. 
And now you know about the two buckets of the Pentecostal oneness and the Pentecostal assemblies. I never crossed them. I planted their own trees right where they were because I think they're both wrong. But out of it, I was at the cross at the harvest. God respects anybody who's sincere. Peter said that. He perceived that God was no respect to person all nations calling when on the house of Cornelius when they received the Holy Ghost like they did at the beginning. See, God is no respect to person. We see a person deeply and sincere, he can be sincerely wrong. But if he is sincerely, God will lead him to the light somewhere. He'll come to it because God's obligated to do that. And we think about the coming of the Lord being such a, a great thing. And the message, no more than it's went, remember, there's a predestinated group to be here yeah. when the Lord returns. And it might not be over a dozen. Yeah. We don't know. It might be a hundred million. It might be ten thousand. But if the predestinated will hear the message and believe it, if it's the message sent of God, which we believe it to be. Now, here we are then, right up here to the end of the time when... If God did call me, now listen, this is not to be repeated. If he did call me to be his prophet, then I'm certainly not holding the office of one. Prophets don't evangelize. A prophet hides himself in the wilderness alone with God until he gets exactly, directly what God wants him to do. And he stomps right out and gives his message and back into the wilderness he goes again. He's not an evangelist. Holding meetings and getting cooperations and all these things like evangelists do. He don't teach like evangelists. He has, thus saith the Lord, and that's it, and that's all. He gives it, throws it out, and let the chips fall where it will, and then away he goes again. Nobody knows where he's at. He's in isolation somewhere. Now, I cannot, or if he's called me to be that, I cannot be an evangelist. And if he's called me to be a evangelist, I cannot be a prophet. Now, you get what I mean? I don't know what to do. I've done reverently when he told me first about me holding people's hand and praying for them, then know the secret of their heart and all these different things. And brethren, that's infallible. You know that's to be the truth. Every one of you knows that, see? And how he told me it would blast across the world, and it's done it just exactly. Every nation under the heavens is heard. Everywhere. Newspapers, tape recordings everywhere. I don't know how it's ever done it, but throughout all the world, letters coming in and people from way down and piling in the hot and tots back in there. How those missionaries is crowded back in there with those tapes and given that interpretation of the word. And uh, we hear from all over the world, okay, around the world. Now, these, the church is predestinated universally everywhere. Yeah. Be two in the bed, two in the field, see? Take one and leave one. Now, as I have done the work of an evangelist, and here's my plea, if that is pleasing to God, and I've done the work all right, trusting that I have pleased Him, asking forgiveness for all my mistakes, then He may be calling me from the field of evangelism to be His prophet. Then if it is, I'll leave evangelism. But if he calls me to be a prophet, I cannot be an evangelist. If I'm to be an evangelist, I cannot be a prophet. I'm mixing the two offices. That's where I've always fussed about. Standing on the platform. It's never been good successful. God has used it, but I've never thought it was his direct will. It's been his permissive will. Stand on the platform. A vision or two will knock you out almost, see? And then if you tell this person how to straighten himself up and what to do, and then the next person stands there, he's expecting the same thing and you can't tell him unless something tells you to tell him. Yeah. And then the other people feel like you're a traitor or a backslider or, or a, a demon or something because you don't tell them what they want to know. See, that's not the office, the way a prophet operates. A prophet stays back here until he stomps out into the hospital or wherever he's going with, Thus saith the Lord, and say it, and stomp back out again. Amen. There's no evangelist at all. He don't hold meetings and discuss things. He's got the word of the Lord for whoever he's sent to. Amen. 
If he's sent to the White House, he stomps right up in front of the White House and says, Thus saith the Lord. If it's to the governor of the state, whoever it is, it's thus saith the Lord. You don't fool around with a group of churches trying to get them to come in and take the word and preach these things like evangelists. He's not an evangelist. So you see, brother, that's the reason I don't call myself a prophet. I'm not even in the office of one. See? Now, you understand what I mean? Now, there'd be a lot going on like that for a long time, but I hope to not take too much of your time until I get a little bit of this word I want to read tonight. Now, here's what I'm doing. I have never felt that I should live in Indiana. I'm a, I'm a rambler. I don't... I'll go one place, I think. I'll go over here and I'll settle down here. This is it. I can't do it. Want to go somewhere else? I think I'll go over here. Want to do it? My wife calls me. What's that song they sing about? Restless wind? You've heard it, I guess, most all of you hear them saying... Well, that's what she calls me, restless winds. About time I get here, I think, boy, I've just got to get home. I've got to see the wife and kids. i just got to go to church once more and preach. Now I get here, come down, preach once, kiss my wife, and hug all the kids, get out in the yard to cut the grass, and the airplane goes over. I stop, wipe the sweat off my face, and I want to go with him. <laughs> Somewhere else i got to go. Well, I think i got to go down there, and I, I go down there, and I preach there a while, Look around. There goes another one over. I got to go with him. See, there's no settling down place for me. I just can't do it. I'm restless, shifting place to place. Something I can't help it. It's something in me, and I know that I must do it. Now, at the church is in its present state. I'd feel horrible to walk away from here. And think of all you man sitting here that I believe I'll spend an eternity with over glory land. We got fine man, fine material, solid, sound people. Just recently there's a revival broke out in the church here amongst the people. The Spirit come among them, begin to give gifts. I watched it to see if he'd go off into fanaticism. Every time we start moving that way, the Spirit check it, bring it back here. I don't praise the Lord. If you just hold your place, sir, that's fine. See? Now, what my thoughts is, is this. Is if it could be possible that when I start going somewhere, I don't know where I'm going. But I can't sit still. I ain't going to stay here. I just can't do it. I got to move somewhere. And I probably won't stay there, but a few days be moving somewhere else. I got to go somewhere. I don't know where I'm going. Neither did Abraham know where he was going. He just crossed the river and started off. That's all. I feel that what we ought to do here in this present time, I believe that we need a church. I think, I think the house of God, you say, well, what putting all that money in it if the Lord is going to come? Well, what good is it going to do to keep the money if the Lord comes? See? If the people designate the money for the church, it's our duty with a 100% vote here that I took that night to build the church. So build it. I'd say build it. Yes, sir. I've never expressed this before, but I want to do it before you man. Didn't want the women here because one leans this way and that way. Now I'm trying to tell you the reason I want to do it. I think if the Lord's coming next week, let's start the church this week. Mm. Certainly. Let's show him. Let's stand at our post of duty. Yes, sir. And then if we, uh, when the church is built up, why? Say if he's, what if he's 10 years from now? What if he's 20 years? Or what if he's 100 years? Whatever it is, when he comes, that matters not. We know he'll be coming for us before that time because we can't live it out 100 years more. He'll be coming for us, but we got to leave partings behind us. And I thought this, why not then let the church board here speaking to them now? Build that church. Put it up here. Make it nice. And a nice place where the people can come. I'd suggest Brother Neville be the pastor of the church as long as the church suggests him being pastor. That's the vote of the church. As long as he holds a post of duty and stays with the faith, wants to come, feels the leading of the Lord, then the leading of the Lord for him to stay if the congregation votes the same. Then I'd say each one of these men out here, these other men, 
like Brother Crace and Brother Junior and all them, as long as they feel their duty at that post and they're associated here together, you can't go down and meet with the Methodists. You have no fellowship with them. Amen. The Baptists. Amen. You go talking about speaking in tongues in the baptism of Jesus' name, they kick you out that quick. Yeah. That's right. You sit around there, you'd be like a, a dove amongst a bunch of crows. You would have no fellowship at all. You're di- I ain't making fun of Methodists and Baptists now. Remember that. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm just drawing a comparison. And many of those Methodists and Baptists are a good man, godly man. But I'm talking about the fellowship. There's Brother, what's his name back there tonight? The, the evangelist sitting back there, Brother uh, J.T. Parnell. Brother Beeler. I believe this brother sitting here. Some of them, many of you here, man of God, calling in your life. You can be doing something. Just don't sit around. Let's do something. You don't get but one soul saved. Get that one saved. Each one of us. Now, I think this church, if you, man, would, when you build this church, make this like your headquarters, and like Brother Neville here, being like the senior elder among you. See? And sometimes you get a question that you can't discuss uh, out with your church out there. Then... Bring it in here to Brother Neville, and you all discuss it together. If uh, you can't come to any decision, I'll be coming by pretty soon. Then we'll all come together with it. And, and then in there, get training in your own groups, other ministers. Man that you see that has a calling in their life for the ministry. Train them, young man. Bring them in here to the elder. All of you set together in a ministerial meeting. And there, teach the deeper things of God. Don't go on the bad end. Keep someone who you can have confidence in to be kind of like a, a leader for you. And then sometimes if you don't see it just exactly the way he does, go, that's all right. You're in the faith anyhow. Just move along. Maybe when we come together then all of us together, we'll pray. The discernment of God come down and he'll give it just exactly what it is, you see. And let us know just how to do it. And in there, churches can go here and training up a group of men. And if I'm in evangelistic work somewhere, there's places I can place them worldwide. Yeah. What if I was in India? Go back to India. And there I'd say to these people, maybe you'd have thousands of them stay there for a week or two and they see the ministry. They love it. They believe it's the truth. They come out of heathenism. There I've got, and maybe in two or three weeks when it's only there two nights, and maybe 100,000 converted to Christ. Nowhere to go the next day. Take a plane and start back to Rome. Then to the United States. Leave them just like sheep put out among wolves. What if I had a group of men? Young man trained in a message. Okay? To say, now wait a minute. Before I leave here, we're going to set in order these churches. I'll have a man who'd already telegrammed and they got the money. They're on the road here right now to take over this. A good man. There's two or three young men with him who will be his helpers and assistants. And a church of this faith can be set there which will be an outpost in India, outpost in Germany, outpost in Switzerland. While right now, we should have had them all around the nation. It's where I've been. And the message then from there comes another, from another comes another. See what I mean? Now, tomorrow night, or day after tomorrow night, you'll see Max and Bose come down here, which is my friend. You'll see just what one little crippled up Swede did over there in Tanzania. He went in there, and uh, Max and Bose is a good man, but he don't believe the faith that we believe. I've tucked him right out and tucked him and just tied him to such a place in the Scripture. I say, Matson, you're my friend. Now, you're not going to jump or run. We're just going to stand here and hold one of his hands as Christian brothers and talk. See? And they lay the message right to him and he just stand there and say, Drew Branham, you, you sure are right. I say, now, Matson, you don't believe that or you'd accept it. Well, uh, Drew Branham, uh, I, I believe what you say is the truth. Then why don't you accept it? See? Just burn it right down to him and, he, he, and then as soon as he gets away, he's gone. See? But just watch what that man did in his missions over there. Just one man. Because he could send right back to Chicago and pick up Burton and all the rest of them, send them over in there like that, and start to work doing it. And now they're getting up into the tens of thousands of one little revival. Not a man with gifts. 
just the man who had enough courage to go there and starve. What could have been done under this? Could have been ranking in the millions. Sure. We've lost that time. That's what my suggestion would be. Now remember, in doing this you'll find out there may be times that you'll disagree with brother so-and-so. You'll disagree over here. And remember, as long as you get to the spot you say, well, because he don't believe it just like me, uh, I ain't going to have... Then there's something wrong with you. It's not wrong with the other fellow. It's something wrong with you. When brethren who are trying to hold together, there's one thing. We Branhams, there's nine of us, and we fight like pet dogs. But after all, when we got through fighting, we were still Branhams. Mm -hmm. One knowed the other was a Branham, and I knowed he was a Branham, he knowed I was a Branham. See? But we'd fight. You'd do that in your family. But they're still your brothers. And that's the way it is. We might differ. That's all right. But we're still one. We're one in Christ. We believe this message and let's stay with it. And I think that that's the thing to do to keep on carrying on until Jesus comes. And that's what I wanted to say in that manner. And I believe if you'd have like, see, you've got to be enthused with it. If you're not enthused, then there's something wrong. There's something wrong. You've got to just not say, well, last month I was pretty well enthused, but I don't know. See, then there's something wrong somewhere. You've got to be enthused all the time. See? And just keep punching. It's the devil trying to get you. Like, I always liked uh, uh, our last president, Mr. Eisenhower. Uh, I had a great admiration for uh, uh, General Eisenhower. Uh, he said, when we were fighting, he said, there's many times we picked up a shell and threw it into the gun and pulled a hammer on it and let her fall and it snapped. It didn't go off. He said, we didn't surrender. So we might have put in another one and it snapped too. He said, we didn't give up. He said, we kept on snapping until one went off. <laughs> That's it. That's the way to win the war. Keep trying. Throw a shell in and pull it. You've got a purpose, a target to hit. And if it don't go off, throw it out and throw another one in and try it again. Throw it in and try it again until one goes off. There's one of them in there that's alive. And one of them will go off. So that's the way we got to do. You just keep firing away, firing away until something happens. What am I doing? I'm firing away now. I'm going out here and I know him. I didn't lead him. A responsibility. Millions of people looking at you. What you going to do? What's the next move? Some thinks I'm dead. Some thinks this. Even that gunman all the other day said I was trying to commit suicide. Everything. See, out around the country and everything. See, but you got all that to contend with. And then you got the burden of the people. And just imagine what if God would place on you that you know the heart of the people that you're talking to. <laughs> Think about that. See, Brother, maybe, I know you have burdens, but you don't understand. And besides that, here, you've got the responsibility here. You say, well, that ought to be easy for you, Brother Bram. Anything to do, God just tells you. No, He doesn't. I sweat it out just like you do and a whole lot harder. Amen. Sure. I have to sweat it m much harder than you do. And there's going to be more required of me. Where you have to answer for a church. Where you have to answer for your family. Or maybe just for yourself. See, there's millions of souls I got to answer for. I got to know my moves. And if Satan's knocking you for one soul or a few souls that you'll catch, what about how you where millions are sitting in order? How many more blasts is he throwing in there? See? So you got a whole lot to remember, brother. That no wonder I get nervous sometimes. Sure. But now, I'm punching away right now. I throw a shell in it that fires. There it is. If it don't fire... I won't quit. I'll throw that one out as a thud and try another one. <laughs> one of them's going to go off. That's all there is to it. One of them's going to fire somewhere. And then I'll, I want to be on the target. So when it does fire, I'll hit the object that I'm shooting at. And I, you know what I mean, I'm sure. They, there's something somewhere. I'm leaving for these meetings. Just plunging out. No, no. I don't aim to teach these great things I teach you people. You remember what that dream that I got the interpretation was? Go back and store up food. Where was the storehouse? This tabernacle. 
Where is there anything like it in the country around here anywhere that will compare with the message that we have? Now, of course, our little brothers here that's out along here, these other little churches are us. We're one. Where would you go to to find it? Sure, it's comparison anywhere. You go right out in denominational creeds, you'll go right out away from the name of the Lord Jesus, you'll go right out away from these other things. See? And here's where the food's been stored up. Well, one message that I preach here to you all, look, I've been preaching from one to six hours to you on a message. Well, if I had to use one of those messages, I'd take a week to take it, just a little bit here and a little bit there. See? Because it's been stored up here. It's on tapes. It'll go worldwide on the tapes where people in their houses, them tapes will fall right into the hands of the predestinated of God. He can direct the Word. He'll direct everything just exactly to its course. That's the reason He sent me back to do this. Store up the food here. He forbid me to go overseas. Brother Argument might said, well, come go. You got one night, but we'll take you a tourist trip all around over the country. The way I've seen Brother Fred and Brother Banks trying to go. I said, I wouldn't go that way. See, it showed that there was something else. I pressed right up to the mark now, but I don't know which way to go. But the examination laying all around me. Yeah. Did it call me back to the evangelism? Has it called me to foreign missionaries? Has it called me to be his prophet? I'm out of pasture somewhere, whatever I'm to do. I'll just keep throwing shell in and pulling a hammer on it. <laughs> One of them will go off. Amen. But I'm just not going to stay and look and say, Lord, you put the shell in the gun. I'm going to put the shell in the gun and do the pulling myself. Let him do the firing. He's the one to take care of that. Let me just keep moving on. I, when I go on this meeting now, I'm just going out. I don't know. I, I may not say one thing about these messages like a preacher. I may not even have one night of discernment. I don't know. I'm just going not knowing what I'm going to do. I couldn't tell you. I'm just going. And that's, all, and that's what you have to do. You've got something in mind. The people here wants a church. Build it. As quick as you can. Get it up. Get your teachers and things. You brother not in your little churches and uh, you want to, you're doing a work, God will reward you for that. Go out there. Preach. Do everything you can. Let all of you get together. You bunch of men and have meetings and talk on deep things of the scripture and pray. Don't, don't just come here together unless you come for prayer meeting alone. Do your praying in secret. Stay out in a place and go into your rooms, hide out somewhere and just kneel down and just stay before God and stay there. Then if you find out, look like something's moving up or you're just going and you find out it gets a little bit off the word and be careful, no matter how good it looks, stop right there. A wrong spirit struck you because the message of this day is to the word. Okay? Don't. See, if you say, oh, my brother, Brad, my taste, so-and-so, while well, so-and-so stood the other night, this, that thing, take place like this. Watch it. Watch it close. Don't renounce nothing. Just wait and see how it acts and then bring it up to the Word and see how it compares with the Word. Then if it compares with the Word and everything's fine, thank God and just keep moving on. And see, just long as it stays in the Word. That's my opinion, what I think you should do. Brother Neville, Brother Ruddle, Brother Crace, and... Brother Beeler and all you brethren here, Junie, wherever you are, and the rest of you, brethren, God richly bless you. I see Terry, Lynn, Charlie Cox, David, a lot of you young men here. God anoint you. Amen. My, how I would like to pick up a handful of you to be evangelism and set you somewhere. See, Amen. knowing that you come up, you can stand and know the message and study to prove yourself. Do you feel a call in your life? I see two or three young men, four or five, sitting on a row back here. And, and like that, you're a young man. I'm getting old. Brother Neville's getting old. We're a middle-aged man. If time rolls on, we're going to walk off the scene after a while. You've got to fill our shoes. See? And so, you see, and then maybe in that day, even it'll be growing greater. If there is a tomorrow. But while there is a today, let's work wise day. Tomorrow may never come. If it does, let's be ready for it. See what I mean? Now, that's what I would think to you. Would it be wonderful to see a brother up there from Utica, Brother Crace, all you other brethren here, come together, meet, 
come into a place. You ministers set together and discuss things. You've got to have fellowship somewhere. You've got to have something to come together to kind of get together about. You all come together as a group of men and believe one with the other and like that and discuss these problems and set out maybe once a month just ministers alone. Let you meet somewhere in one of your churches. Sit there and discuss it and talk it. Each one of you pastors and evangelists and whatever you are. And then if some great problem comes up you can't settle, then if I'm called on the field of evangelism, I don't know that I will be. If I will be, you know I'll be coming back constantly all the time. And then if you get those things then when I come back here, well, we'll meet together and just sit down there. One of you has a calling in your life. We won't have like private interviews and things we've been having. We'll just come right together and stay there till we have thus saith the Lord. Amen. And if you can get the preacher straight and him going right, look what he's going to do. Amen. He's going to influence us. It would take care of the hundreds of these things. That's it. We're just beating that, you see. You've got to get it a system, God's system. Like uh, Jethro said to Moses, why, you can't beat out all of them. Or, and God put elders out there, 70 of them, and took the Spirit was on Moses and put them up on those 70 elders, and they prophesied. Yeah. And it didn't weaken Moses a bit and strengthen him. Yeah. He had just as much prophecy in him as he did before they took the Spirit off of him to prophesy. See, yeah. he just separated the sign of Moses. Let them judge the smaller things. And, uh, but when it comes to the major things, you come in with them and help them like that. Now, that's the way. That was God's way back there. That was God's way in the, in the early church age. And I believe it's God's way now. Yeah. That's right. For us to do it. So yeah. let's do it. Just quit talking about it and do it. Yeah. That's all. We can do it by the grace of God. Don't you believe it? Yeah. I'll, now, let's see. Oh, I've done tuck my time up. But uh, Billy wrote a note here just a minute. I'll see what it is. I'm from New Albany, daughter of Grace Memorial Hospital, broke her arm, uh, uh, wants prayer for her. T-R-O-U-B, W-C, Trobe, Trobe, something like that. Let's have prayer for this young lady. Our Heavenly Father, as we're speaking now, and I'm thinking that maybe when Irenaeus looked out Upon his little group of man. It perhaps is a lot smaller group than here tonight. And they didn't have a seat to sit in. They sat on old coal slabs. Of rock. And they sat there. And he talked to them. Those men went out. Even when they go. They know that they could be fed to lines. Their heads chopped off. But the faith of our fathers are living still in spite of dungeon flame and sword. I thank you for these men, Lord. I pray that you will bless them. Now I bless each of them in thy name, that you will keep them in the faith that was once delivered to the saints, that never will they vary from that. And out of this group may you send pastors, teachers, evangelists, O oh God, grant it. And may they hold a fort everywhere, wherever they are, May they continually work until Jesus comes. And now, Father, I pray for each of these requests that's come in here tonight. And I ask that you'll remember this little lady down here that just broke her arm. May the power of Almighty God heal her and make her well. Grant it, Lord. I pray that you'll help her and bless her. Bless her loved ones for calling. And may the power that raised up Jesus out of the grave raise up this girl. May her arm get well. All these requests that was made mention tonight, that poor boy laying there, it's got, it's, I heard the brother announce it, that uh, the Hodgson's disease has eat through him until his face is burned up with radium and things are given him. God be merciful to that boy. Let him live. We think of that man that didn't prepare to meet you and has gone on now. His wife with a crushed head, the adopted child, all these others, Sister Bruce, packing that water. She's getting old, Father. And there she burned her arms and up and down her body. We pray for her. She's probably hospitalized, and we pray that you'll deliver her and bring her out. Grant it, Father. We ask these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I want to ask you something. 
and um, asked you if um, if you believe that we have time just for a little bit of the word. Do you have it? Yeah. We just for now. It's, I know it's a little late, but I had a little something here that I thought out today that I would like to to speak on just for a minute, and it might help you. And I thought first that I would announce this. Now, it's on this tape. And if anybody would ever want to refer to it, Jim will have it, see, to what I think ought to be done. And now what should be done to the, for you brethren. Now, do you know when those early men went out, sometimes there were only about six or eight of them together? And they shook the country. What well, do you know when Aquila and Priscilla, that great revival that Apollos was having over there, there's only about six or eight men and women in that bunch? That whole church meant six or eight. You got five or six, seven times as many here tonight as they had then. You know, Jesus only had 12 apostles. We always think it was something big, but God don't deal in them big numbers. It's in these little groups is where he gets us in. Look all down through the age at any time he ever met with man. It was in small groups. See? And spoke with them and ordained them. It's God's good pleasure to do that. That's why he likes to do it. And now we just want to keep God in our midst and go do these things. Now, it's Sunday morning. Lord willing, I want to speak to you on evening time evangelism. And then I'll, if the Lord permits... I'll probably be leaving until late this fall and uh, before I get back again. I'll probably get back sometime in, around in September. And now I'm, I'm hoping by then that everything will move wonderfully for you, brethren, and your meetings will grow in numbers and the grace of God be upon you all and, until we meet. And I'm trusting that you will pray for me and the success. Amen. Remember, it, your prayers... For me, that means you're my colleague, you're, you're my buddy, my helper, and together we are helpers in the Lord. And now when I'm standing out there before the enemy, I, I want to remember that faithful, true soldiers that gets prayer answered for the sick and the afflicted, and those men are praying for me. I'm the one who needs it out there. I am really need it. So you all pray for me when you gather. Don't forget me in any meeting. Pray for me. Now, in St. John, the ninth chapter, I want to read from the 26th verse unto the 35th. Now, just for a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll close in the next 20 or 30 minutes, or maybe before that time, the Lord willing. Now, I want to read these scriptures now from St. John 26, to uh, St. John 10, 9, uh, 26 to 35. I've got wrote down here. Just something I was thinking of. Then said they unto him again, What did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him. And said, Thou art his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, but for this fellow we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, has it not heard that any man has opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Then answered they answered and said unto him, Thou was altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out, 
And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, I'd like to speak just for a few minutes to you, brethren, knowing that my little talk here, I don't know what will become of it, trusting that God will use it in some way. And now in this, upon his word, so I know that Brother Saint, Brother Neville, or one of you ministers usually preach. And just being here with you, uh, if you'll pardon me, I'd just like to speak to you a little bit on this manner. Now, I want to take a subject here of taking sides with Jesus. The Pharisees and leaders of his day always tried to belittle him before the people. That was just a way that the devil had a working. All the Pharisees and the teachers of his day constantly tried to belittle Jesus. They were all the throw off that they could give to him, they done it. They watched him constantly to find where they could find a fault, and they never spoke of his good things. They were always finding something that they could belittle him about and say, You see, looky here, if he was a man of God, he wouldn't do it this way. Or if he was a man of God, he wouldn't do it that way. They were trying to cast the shadow upon him to get the people to disbelieve him. Amen. That's the work of the devil. Amen. And that old scheme has never ceased. Amen. There's many times that a minister will make a mistake. And if he comes into a neighborhood, a precious brother who's trying to do what's right and to lead the people right... Everything that the devil can point to the unbeliever or the so-called Christian in that neighborhood to throw off on that man, he'll do it. You know, the real Christian way is to hide everything you can from a brother. Don't tell his bad things, just tell his good things. Just tell what you know about him's good. If anything's bad, let it alone. Poor fellow's got enough against him anyhow. Don't try to take a pole and shove a man further into the ditch. The Christian attitude is pick him up and take him out of the ditch. They don't never try to shove him down. He's down already. Try to help him up. And But too many of us today, too many people today, I might say, try to do that. If they could just get something or another that they could say that was real bad. Now, for instance, if, if one of you brethren would make a mistake and do something wrong, which you're subject to do it, I am too, every one of us. But as we go along, let's remember we are brothers. We are brothers. And if we got any fighting, let's fight with one another. Bring it together. Bring it before our brethren and settle it. Now, they used to in the Branham family, if one of the little ones done something, they'd go tell Bill about it because I was the biggest. And I had to stand there and see which was right and wrong. Well, my decision was that uh, if they... Uh, it, it, which one was right and wrong? If they still didn't believe it, then he got around behind my back and fought it out. But they were still brothers, you see. They'd fight in the backyard with one another and fight in the front yard for one another. So that's the way it was. See, and it, it, we're still brothers. Well, that, that's the way we, we got to do this. See, if you got something against somebody, your brother, don't tell somebody else about it. If it's wrong, go to him and tell him. And then if, if he's going to argue with you, then take somebody else with you. Then bring it up the way the Bible said. But Jesus, they, they just tried to find every little shadow that they could find. To try to belittle him in the sight of the people. And that's what the devil wants. They want to, they want to hurt your influence before the people. That's why you want to watch careful what you do. Walk like real man of God. Talk like man of God. See? Act like man of God. Live like man of God. Because a devil, your adversary, is going about like a roaring lion trying to devour what he can. Why did they do this? They were jealous of him. That was what's the reason. They tried to belittle him. They were jealous of his ministry. And that's the reason they were trying to belittle. But he had the ministry of God and they knew that. But it was contrary to their creed, so they were trying to belittle him. 
make everything, every little flaw that they could find, get him out of the way. They wanted him to quit. They wanted the people to denounce him. They wanted to say, now, uh, this guy's nothing. Looky here. Now, there he is. He, he, he did this. And you know that's not right. We've been taught all of our life that we should believe the elders. And here he is stood right there and bawled that elder out. He disagreed with the tradition of the fathers. And we've been, we are to believe the tradition of our fathers. We've been taught that by each rabbi all the years through. And here this man comes around and disagrees with him. See? Well, the man like that ain't fit to be a preacher. See, they were trying to belittle him. But in all of that, the ones that believed him and loved him and had seen his scriptural miracle signs would not be hindered by them. Amen. No, sir. Them who believed him, believed him. Amen. Those who loved him stood by him. Yeah. They would not see what others pointed out to him. Amen. Oh, if we could do that. Amen. If we could just not see. If somebody come around here and say, you know what? They say you're a Pentecostal. Not by denomination. Well, you was the, you, you were the kind of baptizers in Jesus' name. Yep, that's right. Well, let me tell you something. I know a man one time was baptized like that, and he did so and so, but look, he, that has nothing to do with it. It's a devil trying to throw a shadow on you. They're always trying to point you to some old ship that got wrecked up on the seashore, but they're not pointing you to that one that made the void safely. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. They're always trying to, throw a crow bait out there and say, this is the example. Here's what did it. Uh, I know a certain preacher that was a holiness preacher and he did this, that, the other, but they don't point out others that wasn't a holiness did that also, you see. And they don't point the great things that God did. Like somebody say, oh, here this man went too far. He, he went too far. He might have done that. He wrecked himself up. He went too far. He become a fanatic. He might have done that. But while they're pointing to how many that went, one that went too far, how about these millions that never went far enough? Yeah. They fail to see that. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. So the people tried them Pharisees and Sadducees and hypocrites and Herodians and all tried to cast a shadow on Jesus. But them true believers that was predestinated to hear that message Heard it and see no fault in it at all. Amen. Same now. Amen. Those who believe him, love him. Amen. Those who believe him, see no fault in him. Amen. They don't see any heresy. They don't see anything wrong. They don't see anything wrong with his word. They don't see anything wrong with his people. They just see Jesus. And that's all. Amen. They're, they're, they're predestinated to eternal life. So they just take sides with Jesus and stay there. We used to write, sing a little song, Brother Roy uh, Roberson. We used to sing a little song here. I guess time you come here. I take the way with the Lord's despised few. I started in with Jesus and I'm going through. Yeah. I'd rather walk with Jesus alone and have for my pillow like Jacob a stone. So, well, you've heard the little song. That's right. I'd rather take the way of the discard. Take the way of the despised. Take the way of the talked about and walk with Jesus. See no fault in it at all. Don't see another fellow's error. Just keep on going. That's all. Now that's what they did to Jesus. They didn't, they didn't, and you must teach your people, you pastors, to do the same. Uh, if somebody comes along and says, uh, you know, uh, your church, they were so and so. They, yes, sir, they maybe a dozen of them sitting there then, but how about that one? It's, it's, it's all right sitting there, see? You're, 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 you just can't see the woods for the trees, that's all. <laughs> that's it right back again. See, now, and so they tried. They was not willing to admit that he was doing the work of God. So they were trying to sow discord and get the people not to believe. But them people who believe him stayed right with him. They took sides. You know, I thought you're a couple of people I got wrote down here. The blind man would not be changed by them. That man, he just gave his sight. We know the story. And um, he gave them a very stinging question besides. Now they come up there and Jesus walked by and he was a man that was despised and hated. The Bible said he would be rejected. Uh, there'd be no beauty of him. We should desire him. And all we like sheep have gone astray. He's a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. 
And how all the Bible said what he would be, he'd be despised and rejected. And we see that man. Now, those who believe the word, they know that the very things that Jesus was doing and the things was of his life, they knew who he was. Amen. So they couldn't put nothing blight on him because they couldn't see it. Amen. And you know, love is blind anyhow. <laughs> love covers up a multitude of sin, you know. Perfect love. Cast out fear and sin, all discard. Love does. Now, this blind man was sitting there, and Jesus and his disciples come by. And I think Jesus gave them a little lesson here. When they seen this poor blind man, they thought, well, now surely there's a sin behind that somewhere. When we see something happen to a man, we always say, well, he's sinned. He got out of the will of the Lord somewhere. When Brother Christ hit the post, he got out of the will of the Lord somewhere. It's somebody's idea. When the gun blowed up on me, well, is, is out of the will of the Lord. Brother Neville hit the car, is out of the will of the Lord. That's not exactly right. No, sir, it isn't. God permits those things. Jesus turned around and taught him a lesson. They said, his father must have sinned, or, or did his mother sin? Or did he sin? Jesus said, neither of them sinned. But that the works of God might be made manifest. Amen. See? God lets things happen just to, for the works of God to be made manifest. Amen. Now, and so he said, told the man and give him his sight and he went his way. And here come the Pharisees up when that was rumored around. Here was the man is blind, sitting out there begging. And here he could see. And that's the rumor around among them. And oh my, that stirred up something. And here they come up there and they see that the blind man could see. And first they went wanted to find some way to put a fear upon all the people because they had already said, if anybody goes after this new doctrine and this new prophet called Jesus of Nazareth, immediately they'll be handed their paper and fellowship from the church. They cannot go to synagogue no longer. If you associate with him, attend one of his meetings or anything, you can't go no more. So they wanted to make a big display out of it because they hated him. They wasn't thinking of that poor blind man but they wanted to make a big display to make the people keep away from him. Amen. They said they wanted to ask his father and mother. So they went and got the father and mother. They said, is this your son? He said, yes, sir. It, was he born blind? Yes, sir. And uh, what means does he see? And the father and mother was afraid, the Bible said, because they know they'd be put out of the synagogue. If they admitted it, it was. And see, there they was taken down. They said, now, we know this is our son. Oh, probably a few thousand people stand there. But if he could, if them stinking Pharisees could only put a blight on his name right there or done something to scare the people, they'd run him out of there for that meeting, see? Yes, All of his influence had been lost. So they said, uh, a bunch of them come up there with their priestly garments on, and they said, uh, speak for him. They said, we know this is our son. We know he was born blind. But now how he sees, I don't know. You ask him, he's of age. Eh? All right. So they went over and got him. Said, who give you your sight? How did he heal you? He said, uh, one called Jesus of Nazareth. Give me my sight. And they said, give praise to God. Said, why, well, we know this man's a sinner. Said, uh, and I said, uh, when says he? He said, I don't know. He just come by and heal me. And that's all I know about it. I know one thing I do know. I couldn't tell you about him being a sinner or not. I don't know. I've just met the man today. But if, if he could give him my, my sight, I know this one thing, that where I was once blind, I can now see. Amen. I'm sure of that. <laughs> For I was blind a half hour ago. And now I got just as good a sight as any of you fellows. Amen. So I know I can see. Oh, what a stinger that put on him. So they thought, well, he said... Well, I said, do you all want to be his disciples too? <laughs> that's good. That's good, solid testimony. <laughs> that, that, that's good. That's good background. <laughs> that, that, that's really good witnessing. What I'd say. Amen. Said to you all, here's a lay member, a blind man, standing on the street after meeting Jesus. Now, asking the disciple, asking the Pharisees if they want to be his disciples. Amen. The bishops. Amen. Head man. You want to be his disciples also? They said, Nay, you're his disciple. We're Moses' disciple. Looking way back down through history, you know. 
We're Moses' disciples. This man, we don't know nothing about him. We don't know where he come from. Well, we haven't got a rule of any of our schools he ever come up. He never come and asked us about these things. See? We don't know nothing about it. You people out there, you realize that man's not ordained. That man's a soothsayer or something. He's Beelzebub. You're being bewitched. Why, he doesn't have any authority. We haven't given it to him yet. See? We don't even know whence this man comes from. This old boy standing there could see. Said, now, this is a marvelous thing. <laughs> see? He's about to get the people beat down. These Pharisees was making them afraid. See? But he had done such size with Jesus. Amen. See? So he said, uh, this is a marvelous thing. Let me break it down to some of the words he might have said. Now, you fellows around here has been running all the religious into this for hundreds of years. And uh, you speak of a coming Messiah. And something is going to take place just in the shadows of time. When the Deliverer is coming to see us. And you tell us that when he comes, that, that what all he's going to do. In here, you the spiritual leaders, the high priest and priest of this community, standing here together before these people, trying to blacken his name, trying to say something evil against him, and the man come and open my blinded eye. I was born blind. Here's my father and mother giving witness that I was born blind, been sitting right here among you for all these years. Born blind. And that has never happened since the world began. And here a man can come and perform a miracle that hasn't been done since the world began. And you, the spiritual leaders, and don't know nothing about it? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> mm. I say this is a marvelous thing. <laughs> he took sides with Jesus. See? He was permitted to be blind so the works of God could be manifested. Amen. See? Because he come on the side of the Lord Jesus. He took sides with him. Now he put a stinger to him. You know what they did? They said, now we know you were born in sin. Try to teach us. And he shoved him out of the church. Amen. Knocked him out. Pushed him out. Throwed him out. But as soon as he was thrown out, did you notice? Jesus found him again. Amen. 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 Jesus found him again. So don't worry if they throw you out. <laughs> He'll find you again. Amen. All right. And he said to him, Does thou believe on the Son of God? He said, Lord, who is he? <laughs> he didn't even know. But the only thing that he knew that where he was blind, he could then see. Amen. I know this one thing, brother. They might call this fanaticism and whatever they want to. But where I was once the sinner, I, I've come into grace now. Amen. Something has happened to me, see. This one thing I, I now know. By trusting His Word, by believing Him, I've been kicked out of every organization under the face of heaven. There's none of them that will receive me anymore. You know that. Some of their man will out here, a good man will accept but every organization is thumbs down on me. That's right. But He's found me. You'll find me somewhere. That's right. That's right. Come along like that. And um, so it'll be all right because we want to take sides with Jesus. And the only way you can take sides with Jesus is taking sides on what He said. Amen. Believe in His Word. So let's take sides with him. The blind man gave him a real testimony. All right. We find again that they tried to blight his name just for a little bit. And um, I've got to skip over some things here. So um, one time there's a Pharisee. I preached on it here some time ago and called it washing Jesus' feet. I believe you all heard me preach on that here. When a Pharisee asked Jesus to come down to his house, a big old stiff starch a Pharisee, and asked him to come. And you all know, gave it a little drama, how the courier come and found him. And, and he come on down, yet he knew he was hated, yet he went anyhow. And when they got him in there, they never washed his feet, and let him sit down there stinking and everything else in the tar of the road. And there he sat there, and a little woman come in. They thought, oh my, the Lord is good to us. Because look, this just brings our big party. They brought him there just to make fun out of him. They brought him there just to have some fun from him. And now they thought the Lord was working right with them because that this ill-famed prostitute woman come over and was crying and washing his feet with her tears and wiping them with his hair. 
And old Pharisee and all the rest of the priests stand on the corner. That brother, everything, the Lord set it up just exactly for us. Here we can put a smear on his name right now. He calls himself a prophet. And the people think that he's a prophet. And they call him the Galilean prophet. And he even claims to be the Messiah. And we know Messiah will be a prophet. And here he is sitting back there. You see where we brought him? Look at there. Boy, we got him fixed right now. There he is sitting back there. Stooped down like a whipped out puppy or something back there. And some prostitute of his own class would come around and wash his feet like that. And now he don't even know if he's a prophet. He didn't know what kind of a woman that was. Now, boys, we'll drink on this one. That because, look at see, anything to blight his name. Amen. Anything to ruin the confidence of the people. Amen. Not knowing that they were possessed of the devil to do that. Amen. They were working in harmony with the devil. Amen. Trying to blacken the name of the Son of God. How did they do this, brethren? Because they never searched the Scriptures. Amen. Jesus said, search ye the Scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Amen. Oh, what a ministry he had. See? Yes, sir. If I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. See? Amen. But here this Pharisee said, we got him now. Oh, look here. There's probably 1,500 people here at this feast. Now look at him sitting over there. There he sits with a prostitute. And oh, my, what a horrible thing that was in that day. Mm. And there he was with an ill-famed woman slipped in, like, looked like he slipped in. He got by the foot wash flunky and everything else and sat there and said, here she is over there washing his feet. Now, if he was a prophet, you see, brother, that man's no prophet. If he was a prophet, then he'd know what manner of woman that was washing his feet. And Jesus just sat and watched her. <laughs> Never moved a foot till she got on. If you're going to do something for Jesus, Jesus sat and watched you do it sometimes. He, he lets you go ahead and you get finished. Then the reward comes. Maybe you run the whole race of life working for him. But don't worry. There's a reward at the end. Amen. If you just take your way with his side, you might not see one person he'll let you pray for. Just keep on praying for him. Amen. I've often said if I prayed for 500 tonight, all 500 dead in the morning, tomorrow night I'll be preaching divine healing and praying for the sick. Amen. See? Don't have one thing to do with it. See? He'll let you come right down through defeats and everything else till you come right down to the end of the road and finish your work like he led that woman. She wanted to do him a service, so he just held his feet out there and let her, let her wash him. Or if he said, don't do that, she'd have jumped and run. But he let her do the service. And after she got through, finished the service that she was going to do, then he looked up to that hypocrite standing back there was trying to cast the blackness on his name. He said, Simon... I've got something to say to you. Not to her, but to you. <laughs> you standing back there in your heart. That's the reason you brought me down here. You had no fellowship with me. Didn't I know it? But you brought me down here. And you set me back here to make fun of me. Let, you never give me no water to wash my feet. You never give me nothing to soothe me. Me sitting here burning and hurting. You never give me no oil for my face. You're ashamed to kiss me welcome or shake my hand. You're ashamed before your company. You're ashamed to do it. This woman, since she's come in, she's did nothing but rub my feet and bathe them with the very tears of her eyes. Wiped them with the towel of her own hair. Then I'll just show you where I'm a prophet or not. <laughs> I like that. Now... I want to speak to you just a minute. Your sins, which are many, are all forgiven you. Mm. Did they blight his name? They thought they had it. They thought they'd stopped it. They thought they'd fixed him so his revival could never be in that community. They thought they'd ruined his influence. But it just taken one person that loved him to turn the whole situation... How do you know that you're not that person for your community or somebody that you'll meet? Take sides with him. Do him a service. Do something for him. You know what I mean, brethren? Take your side with Jesus. Take him, make him your choice. 
Do service for him, regardless of whether anybody else or you're ever repaid or anything. Don't make any difference. Wait till the work's over. How would you like for him to say, even though you had prayed for sick and they didn't get well, though you prayed to get to speak with tongues and you didn't do it, you prayed to prophesy you didn't do it, but yet the only thing you do is tell the story of Jesus in your church or in your community, at your work. You couldn't even do one thing, didn't lead one person. That woman didn't lead one to Christ. But she done a service for him. Amen. What difference does it make? At the end of the road, if he'll say, and I say unto you all your sins. Oh, there, not one prayer was answered for you. Amen. But you come on the basis of my word. Amen. You come because you believe me. And you did me a service. And I say that the many sins that you have done is all forgiven you. That would be good enough for me. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. All right. They want to say the days of miracles are past and, and so forth. Let them go ahead and say it. But let us do the service for the Lord. Amen. They hated him. Because they were jealous of him. That's the only reason. They were jealous. They were trying to destroy his influence before the people, the same as they're doing now. They, if they can just, in, just destroy the influence of the message before the people, then they've got the thing whipped. That's right. Amen. Because, why did they try to do it? Because he was against all their creeds and all their church doctrines. And everything that they believed in and called all their, all their faiths and so forth, he was against it all. And they hated him because he didn't barge in with them. Amen. Now, if he'd have come in and said, Okay, Ephesus, marvelous man of my father, I am Messiah. Come here, K. Ephesus. Do you see that water there? You remember down in, in Egypt, uh, Moses, the great prophet, turned it into, um, into blood. You remember that, K. Ephesus? Oh, young fella, I'm very well acquainted with that story. All right, Caiaphasus, I'm going to turn the water now from water to blood to show you that I am that prophet that Moses spoke of. There it is, Caiaphasus. What do you think about it? What do you think about Caiaphasus being a Pharisee? What do you think about the Pharisees? Oh, I think they're the marvelous race of people. Oh, you all keep the traditions of the fathers just exactly right. You know, you could be the Messiah. <laughs> No, he wouldn't have been. Amen. That would have been a very mark that he wasn't. Amen. When you see somebody come say, come here and I'll show you what I'll do. And come here, I'll do this and do that. You remember right now, there's something shady about it to start Amen. with. Jesus said, I'll do nothing till the Father shows me first. Amen. Amen. Yes, he was against them. He taught against them. <clears throat> he condemned their Sabbath keeping. He condemned the way they dressed. He condemned all the ways of their life. All their traditions, all their pot washing and kittle washing and hand washing and everything else. He condemned it every bit. In their dressings, he said, you wear broad garments and desire the high seats and, and make long prayers. And the width of our widow's home said, you'll receive more damnation. Well, remember, I'm doctor, so I don't care who you are. <laughs> oh, man. He really put it on. They did. Why? Because they didn't believe him, he was the word. See, Amen. he was trying to break up that legalistic bunch. Amen. And if he's here on earth today, he'd try to do the same thing. Amen. Some people say, Well, now wait a minute, we keep the Sabbath, ever we do this, and uh, you know, we keep all this and we keep that, and ever, why, ever Good Friday, why, when fast time comes on 40 days before Easter, we always observe Lent. I give up smoking for 40 days. I give up drinking for 40 days before during time of Lent. Oh, tradition of the fathers, legalists. If you love God, you, you don't smoke in the first place. Amen. You love God, you... I, I wrote in the back of my little Bible, first one I ever had. I said, don't ask me foolish questions. Make this up in your mind. If you love the Lord with all your heart, you don't smoke, drink, or, or don't smoke, chew, or drink any shine. And that still stands good today. I don't do it because I think he condemns me for doing it. I would quit it because it's a dirty thing and isn't becoming to a minister. Amen. That's right. I wouldn't say Many times I go to houses and there are women standing out there. And I go to the house, knock on the door, and a sister comes to the door. She come in, Brother Brandon. If her husband's not there, I, I, unless it's a case of sickness and somebody with me, I don't go. And then uh, call me to a hospital or to a room 
Say, Brother Brad, come over here. I'm sister so-and-so from so-and-so. I'm, I'm here at the hotel. I, I, I brought my mother along. She's sick. I take my wife. If I don't, I take some other brother. See, I, I, don't, I don't think, I think it'd be all right for me to go in there. But what if somebody see me go in there? See? What if somebody see me do it? See? Then the first thing you know, they'd say, he went in there where that woman was. He's chasing after women. That, see, that would be a, a thing I shouldn't do. See? You should not never do anything like that because you put a stumbling in somebody else's way. See? I don't believe it. I would do anything wrong in there. Wouldn't, I wouldn't trust God to go in there. No matter what the thing was, I'd trust God. But yet, you see, and, and, and I love the Lord well enough till I wouldn't do it. See? It's a love you have. You, you're not doing it because it's a duty to do it. You do it because you love the Lord. You don't have to do it, but you do it anyhow. Yeah. Paul said to me, all things are lawful, but not all are expedient. See, Paul could do lots of things that maybe that he knew the Lord, understood him and trusted him, but it wasn't expedient for him to do it. So that's the way these legalists trying to say 40 days before Easter, we always start in a fast. And they eat just as much as they ever do. Maybe they say, well, I don't like beans, so I'll give up beans for Lent. I've heard them say that. I don't like pork, so I'll just give up pork, you know. I'm going to quit drinking for Lent. One woman told me, she said, you know what I give up for Lent this year, Brother Ram? I said, no, I said, candy? I said, I, I never did care too much for it anyhow. <laughs> See? There you are. Now, they call that fasting. See, legalism. They say, well, I got to, you know... I, I staggered at church a long time because I tell you, I kept Sunday school for a full year because my teacher said if they'd give a Bible to the one that didn't miss a day. Oh, brother, that's some way of going. I'd rather just go buy me a Bible. Amen. See? If you don't go to church because you love the Lord, you might as well stay away. <laughs> that's all. See? Because you go there for you love God. Amen. I think of this song we sang, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Yeah. Fellowship of kindred mind is like to that above. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. See, that's it. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. I've seen the time, brother. Let me not condemn us. But let me just wake us up to something. I've seen the time in this church that when people had to wait until Wednesday night to meet one another, they would cry over it. That's right. I've seen ministers come in here and would say, how do you do it? Well, then people just want heart. See? They meet the door and say, them sister meet one another back there and hug each other and say, sister, be sure to pray for me now, honey. I'll see you again Wednesday night. You'll pray once you pray for me. I'll be praying for you and making like that. And tears in their eyes. See the brothers shake one of their hands and just could hardly get away from each other like that? That's real Christian fellowship, see? See? Just waiting, praying for each other. Yes, sir. That's the way we should be. All right. Now, these men that made these statements, they wasn't bad men. They didn't mean to be evil. They thought they were doing a service for God. Them Pharisees and things, they wasn't bootleggers and drunkards. They were religious men. It wasn't bad. They just, they just did not accept the word of the truth. They did not accept the spirit. Why? They held to their creeds and their, their leaders' traditions. See? It showed that they loved their leaders. Here's big Caiaphas is the high priest. There's the rest of those big priests. And those men go along. Now you take like Catholic. They're not throwing off to them. Same thing in Protestants. You take a Catholic. He loves his priest. And, uh, and I tell him about the word of the Lord. And, sh- and he sees the works of God. He say, but my, my church don't believe that. And you go talking to him, pinching him out. say, a woman said to me today, said, it's a sin for me to listen to you. See? She didn't want to be bad. She just thought so much of her church and her priest. Tell her she listened to anything else. She was loyal to that priest. Jehovah Witness is loyal to what they believe. 
The Baptist is loyal to what they believe. The Presbyterian is loyal to what they believe. And they're just as loyal to their pastors. Can't we be that loyal to the Word? Amen. See? Now, if those... I want to ask you something. You say, well, Brother Bram, how do you know they're not? Now, if those Pharisees and Sadducees and leaders of that day would have got away from their creeds and their dogmas and listened to what the Word said... And what Jesus is telling just exactly what Messiah was supposed to do, they would have held on to him. Amen. See? But they thought so much of their leaders, they wasn't bad man. They wouldn't steal, lie, cuss, anything like that. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't commit adultery. Why? Certainly not. Why? They would witness the stoning of one that had did such a thing. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. They were good man. But the only thing it was, they wasn't spiritual man. Morally, they were fine. But that isn't what counts. And what did Jesus tell them? Even them loyal people, he said, you are of your father the devil. Amen. See, it's the word that counts. Now, I'll hurry just quick as possible. Now, they wasn't spirit-filled, but they were loyal and held to the modern creed of their leaders. See, all right. His ministry was showing up their doctrine. That's what the matter. Now look, I just take it. I just, brethren, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to forgive me right now for being this long. I'm, uh, maybe you won't want me to come back or another. But look, listen to this. See, I want you to be sure to get this. Now, they had their creeds and they were great churches and great people and great man. Holy man, good man, gentle man, fine man. Honorable man, man of honor, educated, smart, religious. Is that right? Yeah. And we all know that. Just as good as you can find anywhere. See? But when Jesus come on, his ministry showed up their doctrine. Because yeah. God was proving by the ministry of Jesus Christ that he was with him. Didn't Peter quote the same thing? He said, you men of Israel, let this be known unto you and hearken to my words. He said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. Amen. See? See, if they, like this blind man said, isn't this a marvelous thing? You're the spiritual leaders of the nation. And here comes a man in and opens my eyes by the power of God. And yet you don't know nothing about it. Amen. He said, this is a marvelous thing. <laughs> he had something, didn't he? Yeah. He sure did. All right. He did. A man that could do this, and yet they didn't know whence he was. <laughs> now, that was a marvelous thing. Now, look at today, brethren. See, we have a, we know we have a move of God. We know it's performing miracles. It's healing the sick. It's even raising the dead. It's casting out devils. It speaks with tongues. Yes. It interprets tongues. Yes. It sends forth prophecies. Yes. They happen. Amen. He shows dreams, interpretations, perfect, strictly. Amen. Then, isn't it a strange thing that great leaders would say was a bunch of crazy people? Amen. When they're the leaders of the nation, the leaders of churches? Yes. That's a marvelous thing. What is it? It's still jealousy. The Spirit and power and Word of God in these last days is short up their dogmas and creeds. That's all right, sir. That they got man blinded by. Yes. So, my young brethren, you all that's going out here in these churches, hold to God's Word. Don't you move. If you can't make it come to pass, don't stand in nobody else's way. Stand there beating at the door. Just pointing right to it. That's right. Stay right there. Don't start fanaticism because it'll show you up. But if you'll stay true and holy and with that word, God will vindicate you. That's right. His ministry was showing up their doctrines and dogmas. So they took every chance to get rid of him they could find. Everything that they could find to get rid of him, they did it. Trying to say, well, now looky here, looky here, so and so, this one. There he's sitting one day in the house of Simon the leper. Not one word said he healed him. He is a leper. Nothing says he healed him. That's right. He passed by the pool of Bethesda. 
And there laid about 2,000 people, lame, blind, halt, withered. And he walked over to one man and healed him and walked away. Say, well, now, if he was Messiah, he'd have healed all of them. If he is full of compassion, as you all say he is, he'd have had mercy on all of them. Everything that they could find to throw a black mark on him, they did it. Amen. Everything they could find, they throwed it on him. All right. They took every chance they could to rid, get rid of him. Question his birth. His birth wasn't questioned. They put that before the people. They couldn't understand how he was born to virgin birth. And Joseph, his father, is supposed to be a carpenter. And he's born before Joseph and Mary was married. They told that before the people. Right. Yes, sir. See, what am I saying now? They're black marking him. See? Look at him. Where did he come from? Look at his mother. No more than a street prostitute. Had this baby. And after the baby was born, she's already pregnant. The baby is to be born. Then Joseph married to hide it. And then he come around with some kind. What's well, the work of the devil? Can't you see? It's that kind of a bird. They throw that before the people. And not reading in the Bible, Isaiah 9 and 6. <laughs> a virgin shall conceive. See, what was it? They got away from the word. Amen. That's it. They throw black figures at his authority. Gentlemen, don't you know we're Moses' disciples? Don't you know we're servants of Christ? Don't you know we search the scriptures daily? And we have not one thing. They said the Messiah would come to his temple. Not one word of him coming to a temple. Where is he at? What school did he come from? Ask them to the brethren. Both Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterian, you know, Pharisees, Sadducees and so forth. What fellowship card does he pack? Where is his authority even to preach? He hasn't been ordained. He hasn't even got a right to preach. He said, my ordination comes from God. Amen. My works vindicate what I am. <laughs> That's right. I don't have to have your papers. See what I mean? They throw that. His doctrine. Why they called him Beelzebub. His doctrine. They couldn't understand why he disagrees with all of the traditions of the fathers. He even disagrees with the Pharisees. He disagrees with the Sadducees. He disagrees with a whole group of them. Amen. Now, where does he get his doctrine? From the Bible. Amen. Of course. Well, you say, well, how do I know that that's right? God backed it up. Amen. That's what the blind man said. It's a strange thing. If you're so right and he's so wrong, yet he can take the power of God and open my eyes and you never have seen it done yet. Even. Amen. That's a strange thing. Oh, my. I like to take sides with him, don't you? <laughs> sure. You say you're Moses' disciples and you're so right and he's so wrong. Then let me see you do the things he's doing. Amen. Amen. That's where his doctrine. They denounced him all of his claims. They said he has no his claims is wrong of uh, being a Messiah. How could he be a Messiah? Not come to the church. How could he be a Messiah? And here we are, the cream of Israel. But the cream had soured. <laughs> yes, sir. Had flies in it. <laughs> so they, they had to skim that off. <laughs> So he said, here we are, the church, the elect, we're, we've kept the tradition, we've kept Moses' laws, we've done all these things and down like this. And here this man comes along and denounces our claims. Amen. And besides that, our holy priest, our holy father, holy this and holy that and all this other kind of stuff and all of our great men and he calls him of the devil. Amen. <laughs> then calls himself the son of God. Oh, my. See, they tried to throw them shadows on the name of Jesus and on Jesus to get it before the people. Much more could be said there, but it takes too much time. But what? But the word and the works vindicated him. Amen. Amen. Oh, to the true believers, the predestinated, that were predestinated to see him and know his ministry, there he was. Amen. No matter if he ever opened his mouth about anything, they knew he was. Amen. Hallelujah. That little old prostitute walked out there at the well that day. Get a bucket of water. And a middle-aged man sitting over there said, bring me a drink. She said, well, it's not customary for you Jews. That's a woman of Samaria. Said. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to. Now she thinks she's a smart like Jew. She turned around and said, uh, I see you're a Jew. And if you're a Jew, of course you're religious. 
And you said to worship at Jerusalem, but our father Jacob drank from this well and watered his cattle here, and the water's deep, and you ain't got nothing to draw with, and we worship this mountain. He said, just stop a minute. Go get your husband and come here. Amen. She said, I don't even have a husband. He said, you've told the truth. <laughs> said, you've got five. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. That little prostitute, predestinated. Amen. Amen. I can just see her set that pot down and she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> see, that seed was laying there. The only thing it needed was water. And the water had fell on it. When it fell upon those Pharisees, they said, It's Beelzebub. <laughs> Couldn't bring nothing, nothing there but weeds to come from. Amen. But when that predestinated seed struck that water of life, she said, Sir, you must be a prophet. I know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. She'd let that water pot into the city. She had something to tell. She said, come see a man who's told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? See, she took sides with Jesus. That's right. Strange thing, wasn't it? All the Pharisees and Sadducees didn't know him, and this prostitute knowed him. See? Why? Those who believed him and loved him and seen his signs, they know that was the sign of the Messiah. Amen. There's no getting around it. They know it. Amen. Hallelujah. When old Nathaniel walked up there, maybe before Philip said, no, I don't know about this, Philip. I've seen a lot of things rise up in these last days. I know there's a lot of things going on. But he walked up there for him and said, I'll go listen to him and see what got to say. Walked up there and Jesus said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. What did the water struck that predestinated seed? <laughs> when it did, he said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Amen. You're the King of Israel. Why about the, the seed was laying there? Amen. Ready. God sowed it back under before the foundation of the world. Amen. It should bring forth the light right at that time. Uh, Hallelujah. Amen. That's my stand right there, brother. Amen. That's where I believe, right there. I preach it and it falls here and there and to go this way and that way to make any difference. Somewhere it's going to strike a seed. And when it did, it'll fly up to life like that. It's as sure as the world. Yes, sir. Like that blind boy said, this was done that the works of God might be made manifest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he knew what was going to take place. Sure it did. All right. Now, the predestinated, when they seen his scriptural signs... Know that the Word vindicated the works, or the works vindicated the Word, Amen. that the Word was right. They were predestinated to see it, and they were right in line to see it, and they got it. Then they said, after they seen they couldn't get nowhere, because the people is predestinated to eternal life, they just go to find it. That's all. All the Father's given me will come to me. Amen. And all that comes to me, I'll give eternal life, Amen. and I'll raise him up to the last day. There'll not be one of them lost. Amen. Amen. I'm holding right to that. Amen. Not by works, not by deeds, not by power, not by might, by my spirit, saith God. Amen. Not what I've done, what I am, or what I will be, but what He is, and I am in Him. Amen. And whatever He is, I'm part of Him. Amen. Amen. I'm saved because I'm part of Him, and he's, He is God, and I'm part of Him being His Son. Amen. That's right. So it ain't what I've done, what I will do, it's what He has done. Amen. That's my trust right there. All right. So they seen they couldn't get nowhere. I'll skip a few of these scriptures here. They seen they couldn't get anywhere with him. So you know the next thing they had to do to try to get him off the field. They went and said to his brethren and his mother, you know, he's awfully tired. <laughs> you should take him off to one side for a while. That bunch of hypocrites. They just didn't, the thing it was, they just didn't want to get, they, a thing they didn't want to do, they wanted to get rid of him. Amen. It wasn't that they thought he was so tired. They'd like for him to work himself to death. But every time he went out, the miracle started pouring. The word of God went forth. I would not like to hear him stand up there that day on the sea coast when he called Simon Peter and said, follow me. Would I like to have got on a chunk and sit down there, left my nets and left my fishing pole, Brother Crace, and sit down there and lean back against the chunk and listen to him preach when he got in that boat. Oh, my, my. Would I love to hurt him when he said that? Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden. I'll give you a Amen. I like to hear him say. They tried to get 
his mother and them to take him off the field. They said, well, you know, he's, he's overworked. I believe you better get him off that way. Any way thing to get rid of him. That's all they wanted. Yes, sir. Again, the many that went with him just to find a place to trap him. Do you know that? People followed right along with him just to find a place. They give him one day a penny. And they said, Rabbi, uh, before they give him the penny, they said, Rabbi, we're Jews. We know you're a great man of God. Oh, that hypocrite. See? We know you're a great man of God. Yes, sir, Rabbi. Just walking right along with him. Oh, good morning, brother. Oh, we're so happy you're over here in our country. Oh, we're so glad to see you. We are really far yet. Teeth and toenails, brother. If you're going to have a revival, we even might cooperate with you. See? What they're trying to do is set a trap for him. See? They said, now, we know that thou art a great man of God. You don't fear favor of no man. You fear nothing but God. We know that you're a bold Oh, you're fearless with your message. We know you're a great prophet. Because no man could do like that, be fearless with his message in a days like this, unless he was a prophet of God, knows where he's standing. So we know you don't respect person no man. Rabbi, you're a great man. We're Jews. We're right with you. Brother, we sure are. Now, Rabbi, is it right to pay tribute to Caesar? Oh, that bunch of hypocrites. Amen. <laughs> The Holy Spirit was with him. Amen. He was the Holy Spirit. Amen. He said, you got a penny? Say, oh, yes, 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 I got a penny. He said, hand it to me. He said, whose inscriptions on that? He said, Caesar. He said, then give Caesar what Caesar's. God's what's God's. Amen. Amen. Setting a trap for him. Professing to be his friends. Seemed like no one could understand him. They'd travel with him a little while and then get disgusted with him and leave. They'd say, oh, well, we thought, we thought surely. Even the disciples said, we thought surely this was he that was going to. to even John sent out and asked him, are you he or do we look for another? <laughs> oh, what a life he must have lived. See? And knowing that. But he had one purpose. One purpose. Do the work of God. Many went with him just to find a place to trap him. Now, I hope it's not sacrilegious if I say it's the same today. Many come in and follow the meetings just to find a place. See, you pray for somebody. Here not long ago, a certain sister that goes to this church was at another church where God was making everything happen. And this sister said to the other sister, said, you know, that man that could pray for the sick said must have a, a, a very victorious life. And said... He must just be able, his family and everything, be healed at a spoken word like that. And the other lady happened to be from Jeffersonville. And I'm sure that nobody has to know but what Jesus said among your own people, in your, you know, your country. That's right. That's the reason I, it may be that right now, coming close, it may be a change of time, you see. And he said, uh, he said, you know what? He said, not one of his kids can have a sniffle unless he takes it to a doctor. A poor, degraded, deluded thing like that. See? See, a woman it, it just wanted to throw off. That's right. Amen. Amen. Said when his children get sick, he takes them to a doctor. Anybody that's sensible will do the same thing. Amen. People can't understand that medicine is sin of God. Amen. Why, uh, brethren, if it's not, it's of the devil. That's right. Amen. Sure it is. God is where medicine won't reach. Certainly. Medicine is of God. Well, you say, I know a lot of doctors is ill. Yes, I know a lot of preachers. It's the same way, too. It's not the man that's handling it. It's what it is. I know a many man's handling the Word of God. Don't believe in divine healing. Don't even believe in God. Right. But they handle it just the same. There's many a man out there with the medicine and surgery and stuff that denies God and everything else. But there's a many one that believes Him, too. If it helps people, it's of God. Amen. I, don't have to, I don't have to take that car and ride home tonight. I can walk if I want to, but God made me a car. So I thank God for it. Amen. All these things come from God, but use them sensibly. Don't go insane with them. Amen. Yeah. The same thing. So that, that's it, you see. Just trying to find something to this young convert to blight their name. The name of, of the works of God. See, yeah. they wanted to blight it. Every time a child gets sick, one of his children, he takes him to a doctor. Sure would. 
And if the doctor can't, I'll ask God to help before we go there. Then if the doctor can do anything about it, then I'll take him up a little higher. That's right. Yes, sir. Oh, just the same today. They're trying to find a trap somewhere. He knew them, but notice he never rebuked them. He went right with them. Mm -hmm. He does the same thing now. He goes right along with them, shows them his mercy. That's right. Though they do it all together against him. Why? Because he loves them. And he went with them. But they're always ready to call on him in a case of emergency. Amen. They want him then. They want, they'll make fun of somebody. A shouting. They'll make fun of somebody preaching divine healing. Say they don't believe in it. They just haven't got sick enough yet. Amen. I've heard of many one. A woman dying just as I ran up the steps. While this preacher right here and the man standing right there at the door calling to me. She'd walk by. She lived up the street here and had a cow out there. And she said, if my cow got that kind of religion that Billy's got, I'd kill the cow. And less than an hour from then, she was stricken and taken to the hospital, a beautiful young woman. And I rushed out there. Her husband is Catholic. And they sent for me. She's dying. And she went, her eyes went to swelling out. She said, call him, call him, call him, call him, quickly, quickly. And her brother ran up and stood there at the door and waited and waited. And he kept motioning for me. And the place is packed full of people. And it was somebody come around, put a note on, on the desk here and said, said, oh, someone's dying in a hospital. And I believe Brother Grimm's selling. I said, take my place till I go. And he was just set up to lead singing. He wasn't even called and to, to preach at that time. He'd come up to lead singing. And I went out. And got in, uh, in my car and rushed out there. And just as I was going up the steps, she drawed her last breath. And, of course, the bowels and kidneys and everything. I, and I run in there and they done covered her face up and steam coming up around like that. And that old nurse standing there, she said, Brother Branham, she screamed her last breath for you. Trying to make it right. But it's too late then, you see. <laughs> you can sin one time too many, you know. Amen. And she kind of had, deep in her face, she had auburn hair. A real pretty woman. And she... Her bobbed hair was all bushed out. Great big brown eyes had pushed out and just half closed. And the freckles on her face had got in such a way, such strain, till they stung out like little bumps all over her face. And her mouth was open. And I walked over and looked at her. And there, her husband stood there and said, Billy, here's what it was. I said, I'm Catholic. I want you to say a prayer for her because she's going to purgatory. And I said, what? I said, say a prayer for her. Said she's gone to purgatory. She passed by your church about two hours ago and said if our cow ever got your kind of religion, she'd kill the cow. <laughs> said, say a prayer for her. I said, that's too late. She should have purged her soul here, not till she gets somewhere else. See? That's right. Oh, yes. But we always want him in the time of distress. People I've heard him say, I don't believe in God. Let him hurt himself right bad once. Yeah. See the first one he'll call on. Even his disciples, one time, when they were in a storm, though when they saw him, they were a little bit afraid of him. They didn't know exactly what it was. They said, it's a spirit, and they cried out. But yet all hopes for being saved was gone, so they invited him in. Amen. Yeah, they're always, whether you're a little suspicious or not, yeah. when all hopes is gone, you like to invite him in. Amen. Yeah. They took him in because they had a need of him. That's right. You know, I've often wondered, sometimes maybe that's why the storms come on. <laughs> Did you ever think of that? He sat up there and watched them until they had need of him, and then he come on the scene. So we can see our need of him now. We see that the storm is coming, brother. Let's take sides with him tonight. Take sides with his word. I, I, I quit here. Um, let's take sides with him. Let's us, you and I, brethren, join up with him tonight. The storms are coming. And don't wait till the little boat sunk. Let's take him into our little bark now. <clears throat> you might look off and say, I can't understand all these things, Brother Branham. See if we say anything but what's in the word. Yeah. See if there's anything there but what he promised to do. It might look a little spooky to you sometime. You think, oh my, I can't understand that. But there'll be a day when this life of yours is leaving. 
it, it won't look so bad to you then. When you know yourself, you've got to turn back to the God that created you. You'll want to take him in then. Let's take him in now before the storm gets any worse than what it is. I want him in my heart. I want him so much in my life to my whole being is saturated that my mind, my thoughts, my everything that I am is governed and controlled by Christ Jesus. I want to be so lost to, to myself that all I'll know and see is Jesus Christ. And if I want to come before you all. If the God of heaven permits you to have these things that I've talked about, when I come among you, I want to know Christ, Him crucified. I, I want to know the glory and precious praises of God. Sit down among you and hear one minister get up and give the praise to God, though what he'd seen done in his church, another than what he saw done in his church, another than what he saw done in his church. That's exactly what they did. And when they come together and met in fellowship in Acts 4, they was given account what God had did over here and what God had did over here. And Peter and John had been whipped and, and, and made a promise that they'd, what they'd do to them if they preached any more in Jesus' name. And they gathered with their people and they all prayed with one accord and prayed in the will of God and quoted the scripture. Why did the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And when they prayed, the Holy Ghost shook the place where they were assembled together. That's the kind of a meeting we need. That's what we got to have, brethren. Let's be fortified by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, by the power of God, and let our light so shine now that we'll be like Stephen's. He stood there one man alone before that Sanhedrin council of a half a million men maybe standing there. Every one of them pointing their finger of accusation in his face. When that little fellow walked out there and said, he shined like an angel. Amen. I don't mean maybe a light on his face like that. An angel don't have to have a light on him, but an angel is a man, or an angel is a messenger, and a messenger who knows what he's talking about. He walked out there and said, man and brethren and fathers, our fathers in Macedonia, how they was brought out in Abraham and so forth, and on to so and so, and then he got down to the spoiling point and said, oh, you stiff necks, uncircumcised in the heart and ears, why do you always resist the Holy Ghost like your fathers did? So do you. He knowed exactly what he was standing at. That's the reason he was shining. He wasn't a bit afraid. He knew in whom he had believed. Even when death knocked at the door of St. Paul's heart. And he said, I know in whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against the day. Amen. The Lord bless you, brethren. I'm sorry I kept you here till 25 minutes until 11. I know this is uncustomary for you. I'm sorry to do it. But you've been real nice tonight. None of you has left. You sit and give your unadvised attention. And I trust and hope that in my little broke up nervous talk that God the Holy Ghost has somewhere has poured out a little seed into your heart that the power of God will strike and bring it to life just like the woman at the well and others who are predestined to eternal life. God bless you. Brother Neville, you go dismiss or what do you want to do? How do you just to, Do you love him? Amen. Will you serve him? <laughs> Will you believe him? Amen. 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 Do you love him? Amen. Will you serve him? Amen. Will you believe him? Amen. 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 And we want to sing it. Amen. 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 The Bible's true. Amen. I believe it. Amen. It's the Word of God. Amen. 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 Let us stand. Amen. 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 Lord, we love you. Amen. 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 We believe you're coming. Amen. We're ready to meet you. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. We pray, God, to let us be our best at all times to serve Him. Amen. 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 I trust that He'll bless you and preserve you and keep you and watch between us and fire you into His kingdom to do great works and help you on the field until we meet again. Amen. 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 I'll pray for you. Will you pray for me? Amen. 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 Our Father, we have assembled tonight in the name of the noble Lord Jesus, that beloved and darling name that we all love and adore. I'm thinking how groups of men down through the years, for 30 years or more, we've assembled in this little old building. How we'd sit around a stove with our feet freezing nearly and sit there with our feet up on the stove and talk about the Lord Jesus. I'm thinking of some precious feet that once trod upon the earth that sat with them feet up against there. I'm thinking of old Brother Seward, Brother Sparks, Brother George D'Arc, many other precious souls that once sat with their feet against that stove, has gone on to meet their Lord tonight, resting out her in the grave, waiting for that great summons for on high. They fought a fight. They kept the faith. They finished the course. And now they're waiting for the crown of righteousness. The Lord, the righteous judge, will give them that day. Father God, we prayed when we dedicated this little church on the corner and said, Lord Jesus, let it stand and people be in it when you break the skies to come in that secret, quick going of the church. God, I pray that souls that's come to this altar, souls that served you, the gospel seed that's been sowed back and forth and back and forth and back and forth across here for 30 years, that we believe many of those precious people will be there on that day because of these feeble efforts that we put forth to bring the word to that predestinated life. We thank thee for it and trust God tonight that not one present now, but what will be present on that day, covered by the blood, anchored in Jesus, granted, Father, we trust in him. Now, we're to meet here again Sunday morning, many of us, and we pray, God, that you'll meet and break the bread of life for us. God, we would remember Brother Ruddle and his place up there where those who are sojourning with him be with that precious boy, Lord. I pray as I see him coming up, see these young fellows, I feel like they're at my Timothy's. I pray, Father, that you'll bless Brother Ruddle and his ministry. Bless Brother Junie Jackson. Oh, God, we pray that your blessings will be upon him and upon our brother Crace, upon Brother Snelling, upon uh, this other brother that's taken his place, and Brother Beeler and Brother, uh, all these brothers, your Lord, and uh, Brother Neville and every one of us, Lord. We just pray that your blessings will be smiled upon us that your grace will be all that we need, Lord, to go on. And may we never forget the little comment tonight. Though that little woman standing there not knowing what the end would be, but Jesus needed attention, and she was giving it to him. Yes, washing his feet, a neglected something that even those who claimed to be his servants had failed to do it. And they were trying to make fun of him, but she did him a service not expecting a reward, and there could not have been a greater given. God, may we do the same. Just press right on and do the service of God. And all we long to do, Lord, is to hear on that day, it was well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. God, grant us to do that and keep fellowship with one another and may the Holy Spirit be with us and guide us and direct us in all we do and give us long life. Maybe if it's possible to see the coming of the Lord Jesus. We ask that in his name. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the time that binds our heart and sin Christian love the fair Ship of kindred mind is like to that above when we asunder.
part. Now it gives a inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to me again. The Bible said they sang a hymn and went out. God bless you now till I see you again Sunday morning, the Lord willing. Bye bye. Jim, I didn't get to shake your hand tonight. God bless you. Lord bless you.